it can also be a day that, you know, feels very, you know, can bring a lot of peace and comfort to some of the families of those women and those um, two-spirit folks. So it's complicated and, you know, however you choose to, to mark this day is, is super valid. So on that note, we are here to celebrate this cis man <laughs> and his little poems. <laughs> But we can't be too hard on Connor because he is famously a simp for the matriarchy. <laughs> he would write poem after poem for us. He would follow us anywhere. And those are his words, not mine. <laughs> so before we get to the main event, we have a special opening act from poet extraordinaire Brandy Bird. Then we will have, um, I'll, do, I'll introduce Connor, Connor will read some poems, we'll do a little Q&A, and then um, maybe Connor will close us out with, with some poems as well. I was saying earlier that um, Brandy is kind of like Catherine Heigl in 27 Dresses, except instead of like a closet full of bridesmaids dresses, it's like posters from other people's book launches that they've been a guest reader at. <laughs> But their own launch is going to be coming up in the fall, so all of those people that you've read for will be indebted to you and they'll have to come and read. Brandy Bird is an Indigiqueer, Soto, Cree, and Métis writer and editor from Treaty One Territory. They currently live and learn on Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam land. Their work has been published in Catapult, Poetry is Dead, Room Magazine, and others. Their first book of poetry, The All Plus Flesh, is coming out with House of a Nancy in fall of this year. They like to listen to the same song over and over again and love their three cats, Baby Doll, Bert, and Edda. Please welcome Brandy Bird. Thank you for that, Molly, and thank you, Connor, for uh, inviting me to read. It's a real honor. Like. Connor's such a, he's, he's a good guy, <laughs> you know? I was describing him to my brother who's visiting and I was like, he's just a, he's just a good Métis boy. <laughs> so I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm gonna read a few poems. Uh, this feels, I don't know, I, I, I read twice in the last two weeks and I'm feeling very like, still feeling very anxious. And I don't know why, so I'm just gonna start. This first poem is called 1999. It's after my favorite poet, Liz Howard. Um, it was the first poem I ever wrote as an adult, and I edited, I've since edited it, of course, um, but it's very special to me. It's going to be my book, and Selena helped me edit it, this person right here. Uh, okay, 1999. Recollect a glacial lake in the eye of mother. Standing in the fan of Lake Agassiz, wide hands on my back against the wind of a leveled plain. Canticle, fertile valley, synchronicity of silt and water split into three by rivers and me. Cold ply of fingers on my sister against walls of neon BLT. Gamble of glacial water, prairie noise, nickel-plated satisfaction of rise of ice on the riverbank and mother's seasons measured by quarters running low. Who knows her habits? Who knows where she'll be tomorrow? My face reflected in hers, so alike in water, porous, plump, identical. I'm still wearing my mask. Maybe I'll take it off? No, that's okay. Okay. Um, maybe that's better. I don't know. Okay, this poem is called Fires in October. It's about last October when we had all those fires. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Fires in October. The heat disorients me. Drought overflows around my body. The world will burn and flood and burn and flood. People will call the weather beautiful in between the rain. An Indian summer and the blurry sunset and my, my father yelling at my mother before he disappears. My first memory. He comes back again, but different. He hunts duck and deer and moose now. He doesn't teach me how. The world has changed so many times and for the worse, for the worse. I can't imagine the heat getting any more bearable. I can't imagine my voice cutting through the smoke. A season of pilgrimage to the places that burn. Everywhere burns. I pray for rain and rain comes, but it's malformed, drops explosive as a gunshot. Rain tears through dirt and the earth is too desperate for the sky. I am too desperate for the sky. To want is to leave myself open to anything that seems alive but isn't. 
Flames, the ghost of memory, the swoon, the flood. The movement as I ignore the past and the future. I can't speak the present out loud or it will transform into a duck flying, always flying. To live outside time is a gift I want to give back and the season suddenly shifts. My father, my father burns pin feathers in a fire pit. I will have something to eat tomorrow. That should be enough. This is a happy poem, as happy as I write poems, I guess. It's called, What Joy? Name me a love name, a name with feathers picked from sidewalks and bound with twine. Create a body of hollows and let me fill them with glass beads and cigarettes. Name me my father and the story he orates when he's drunk on the balcony. Talk about wisdom, a noble bottle of brandy, etymology of family, Foncine, Deleron, bird, and rat. Break all family names into pieces and watch them turn into stones I throw into Lake Winnipeg. Watch me turn to stone, or a pillar of salt, other words for still, silent, other words for weathering the way we love. We are nothing if not forgiving. Okay, how many do I have left? I think I have three left. Yeah. I like to know how many poems people have. <laughs> it makes me feel held. Uh, Okay, uh, this next poem is called The Selkirk Journal Archive. It's based on, off of true events. Um, my grandfather was arrested for drinking off reserve when he was in like the 50s, I believe. And uh, I posted it in my family Facebook group and people were like, that's a different Ronald Charles Bird. And I was <laughs> like, it's not, this is a tiny ass town, Selkirk. Like, this is a, this is him, obviously. <laughs> And I think, I like to know that he had good times. I think that's like getting thrown in the drunk tank. He was having a good time. Uh, it's called the Selkirk Journal Archive, which is the newspaper I found the thing in. My namesake is deep red. Burgundy, brandy, rust on his lips. In red rose tea, in white Pyrex glass, at the Lord Selkirk Hotel, we simply call God. He and his friends, natives like spruce trees, have skin hard as bark. Both are arrested, drinking off reserve. Caged, kept in the drunk tank overnight with handcuffs that bite like barn cats. Off reserve is a plot of land in East Selkirk. He fishes beside it with a silver and bone flask in his shirt. His hands smell like bait and tobacco and my grandma's perfume. He ownerships, sells fish wholesale, and raises 17 kids with the profits. Drinking off reserve, he and his friends, natives like pickerel, alcohol to numb the currents of the Red River. His blue boat, his brown nets, his red skin, all flattened in the prairie sun. Sheen of sweat, a hangover, he wakes up in the clothes he wore yesterday. $22.30 to the judicial body, for the burn through his body, a privilege to lo lose himself like I'm lost. We live in each other's veins. I feel it in a shot of whiskey, the tree his ashes are spread under. Today that tree is on private property. I sing a mansion on the hill. I ownership and drink at the Lord. I ownership and trespass. Okay, two more to go. Okay, all blue and all brittle. All blue and all brittle. A girl can fit inside a fist. I was curled up in one in Ammonite found on Pine Creek First Nation. In a field of canola, in a graveyard on the res, in a glass bottle. I could be 16 again. Pray my eyes bloodshot looked directly at God or the sun, except I never really believed in anything but my own needs. I want to be held by someone fuller than I am. Hold on to what I have like my mother's hand and my bony jaw. She once racked my mouth open with a spar of ivory soap and I spat out water from Lake Winnipegosis. I didn't understand the lake well enough to interpret what I'd said. I'm saying anything to anyone now, spun around because every horizon looks the same. They're all brew, blue, <laughs> they're all blue, and the sky is a bruise that futures on my palms. This violence is quiet, has no body except my body, which is to say I will let the sky silence me. Did I learn anything from my ancestors? Can I twist my mouth open against the clouds? Let me fall and fossilize at the bottom of, my, of the lake. Let my body brittle, let it break off in pieces in other people's hands. And then my last one. Here we go. This poem is called Ars Poetica, which just means like a poem about poetry. So it's called Ars Poetica, or Ocean Vong wrote Loneliness is Still Time Spent with the World. And it's for my neighbor Zara. 
My neighbor quotes Vong, and we both smoke on the deck of our social housing complex, and I know then that there is hope until I die, and then there is other people's hope. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I definitely used Ars Poetica in a sentence before, but I never knew what it meant until like 15 seconds ago. <laughs> You can catch Brandy at uh, another book launch uh, next week <laughs> at Belito. What is it, Wednesday? Yeah. <laughs> launch of uh, Jen Curran's new book of poetry. Uh, all right. Now I would like to introduce Karna Kerr by reading the blurb that I was very honored to write for his book jacket. But Connor was like a little miffed that I used the word desperate to describe his book. So I'm just gonna read it to you and like you can tell me if it's too much. Old Gods offers up an unabashed, desperate, almost destructive nostalgia for the kind of life that has you sweating and grunting, paying attention to your body and how it moves through the natural world. The desperate kind of life that still sometimes exists on the prairie when you're whiskey warm on the back bench of the Greyhound's midnight run, or desperately driving an old beater down the highway, and there's no one around except the desperate coyotes, their deer, and the desperate moon. Don't look at your books, this is word for word. <laughs> when at any moment, you might have to strip yourself of modernity and bullshit and desperation to become more animal, more honest, more desperate. <laughs> when I was writing this blurb, I was home in Saskatchewan and I, I read it to my mom and I was like, what do you think? And she said, well, did you like it? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? I, I loved it. She's like, well, you didn't actually say that you liked it. <laughs> so here I am, Connor, to say that I desperately loved this book. <laughs> I'm not going to read your bio because I think everyone here knows who you are, so the man who needs no introduction, Connor Kerr. Thank you. I uh, keep uh, posting that Molly called my book desperate in all the reviews. Like, yeah, it's just a desperate book of poetry. Uh, I'm like, wow, great blur, Molly, great blur. Um, it's good to see everybody, and thank you for coming and joining me for Old Gods. Um, I was very not stoked on this cover when I was going through the process of it. And I got, I was going back and forth with Nightwood quite a bit on it, but then I, now that's out, I actually like really like it, and I'm very, very happy about it. Um, it's a privilege to be gathered today on the unceded territories of Muslim Squamish Sable Tooth as a uh, Métis Ukrainian cis man. It's always a pleasure to be in such beautiful spaces and also recognize the importance of the day like today. Um, and also, uh, I was, I've been thinking a lot about the current wildfire situation in Alberta, especially the town that I went to high school in, Drake Valley, is currently evacuated. And I don't think that there, I think there's quite a bit of connection between the ongoing genocide of murder missing indigenous women and girls in two spirit, as well as the current climate action or the climate crisis that we see ourselves in. And it's very proven at this point that those are very interconnected things with the uh, violence that's continuing to happen, whether that's against the earth or whether that's against uh, women, two spirit people, and children. So I think being in a beautiful space like this, seeing this art display, and learning more and also continuing to call on governments of all forms as well as on all everywhere you work to start actually looking into the murder missing indigenous women girls and two-spirit calls to justice which was released in 2019 is a very important thing for all of us to consider and do as we move forward um I realized that a lot of this book is, my, my last book, Avenue of Champions, was very much about my grandmother, um, who couldn't make it. She got a new batch of blackberries, and she's currently turning that into <laughs> bounce and jam, and 
she's really into canning right now. It's a big, big, big thing in her life. So she uh, she's couldn't make it because of that. Um, but uh, but I realized that because that book was very much about a lot of her, and I think my grandfather, who passed away uh, a few years back, really informed a lot of this book. And so. Um, I'm going to kick it off by reading uh, the intro poem, which is called Old Hunting Dogs. Years ago, we scattered my grandfather's ashes in an old abandoned settler graveyard a hundred clecks south of Moose Jaw on the east shore of Old Wives Lake. There are a couple old stones buried inside an overgrown caragana bush engraved with Swedish names and places of birth. I wonder what those early settlers thought about when they died in their early thirties far from their homelands. They were younger than I am now. Did they question what the hell they were doing in a place like this? Did they think about the waterways, mountains, and old cities of Sweden with the same longing that I have for endless prairie grasses? Did they wish to be back under familiar stars? Do their descendants know that they're buried here or are they forgotten? Maybe they built up their homestead here because of the way Old Wives Lake kicks up salt on a westerly and carries it in the air. Or maybe they just ended up here because of a failed promise of colonial expansion from a government who would and will never give two shits about the prairie. But I highly doubt that they ever thought of that. Now they rest next to my grandfather and the bones of old hunting dogs and my dad has buried here over the years. My family knows these back prairie roads better than anyone has since the days when they were still old Métis trade routes. They believe in the country as far more than a desolate wasteland, but as an unfolding promise. It holds past and future dreams and plays them out in the present. I don't want to speak to old gods, but they're here. Always have been, always will be. So that's my intro into the old gods of the Saskatchewan prairies. Uh, I'm going to read the next one called uh, The Sun's Always Shining on Saskatchewan. <laughs> Uh, I wake up an hour before the dawn, the smell of eggs frying in butter, split breakfast sausages, the discount kind, nabob in the pot, and an old country song on the AM radio singing us the sunrise. You're standing there, old flannel shirt tucked into loose blue jeans held up by suspenders. You're always way too skinny for your own good. Dreaming of a future in your wildest imagination, you couldn't imagine living this long, having this much luxury, Always thought you'd be dead on the prairie, wind and porcupines gnawing away on your bones. I can't imagine that in five years you'll be gone. I'll be laid up in bed with a busted up leg, your ashes on the bookshelf next to a bison skull that we dug out of the banks of the Moose Jaw River back when I was still scared to lose everything. Couldn't sleep because of the spins, wanted nothing more than to make everyone happy. Something I still haven't figured out, but you never gave a shit about that kind of thing. The sun's always shining in Saskatchewan. The sun's always shining in Saskatchewan. The sun's always shining in Saskatchewan. I just want to talk to you again. So that's my ode poem to my uh, passed away grandfather there. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep the uh, the emo theme going for the first round of books. I saw this like Instagram meme and it was like. I think it was posted on gay rights and it was like poetry so what was it? it was like poetry so embarrassing like, it was like yeah it's just like MSN messenger status lyrics from your thirties and late twenties that's pretty much what this is it's just a book of my MSN messenger statuses yeah. uh, this one's called uh, I Dream of Family do you ever dream in what ifs? of grass growing on dirt fields, graves covered in Saskatoon bushes, and gardens that produce throughout the winter, of a collective pushback in the 1870s from the Cree, Blackfoot, Nakota, Lakota, and Métis against encroaching settlers and Americans, driving them from the prairies on the backs of bison, of grouse that dance throughout the short springs on leks that have seen thousands of years of footprints trampling prairie grass down and down under song, fly into the moon and bring back the stars of a future that saw us take back the notion of crown land and return it to those who maintain stewardship in a reciprocal fashion. Speak the words, but don't hold them to your heart. Fall from grace. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm going to read this one. Uh, what is this one? Sorry. This one I wanted to read for for Brandy and Molly. Um, 
Is it the same favorite poem? No, but it's about an ode to graduate studies. It's also oh, yeah. <laughs> goes out to the UBC people as well because yeah, it was just a. Uh, um, uh, I thought it funny because Molly and I did the same MFA at UBC, but I was in the optional residency one, and then Brandy's just entering that same MFA right now. But um, fortunately, now they have Professor Billy Ray Belcourt to guide guide through that process. Um, so this is called an Ode to Graduate Studies. The end result of an MFA is the idea that writing is fucking stupid. <laughs> Everyone sees it differently, but you do it anyways because, hell, what do you have to lose? I don't see the veins of poems the way my friends do. I just blab on and on about nothing in particular. A skill set for the small talk that isn't available in a workshop that can be sweated out at the bar. I'm a conversation, a first date icebreaker. A scared 30-something white-coated Métis poet trying to keep up with turning language and thought into something decipherable. I spelled that wrong. For others' enjoyment. I don't have an audience except the early morning birds, skunks, porcupines, coyotes, and Labrador retrievers that greet the sunrise with me every morning. Want a ska, motherfuckers? <laughs> right, I'll do... I'll do one more. Um, this I wrote for my friend Emily Riddle, who's uh, a great poet in her own right. Uh, she lived in Vancouver for a while, but now she's back in uh, Miskachi, Waskahegan, in Treaty 6 territory. And she's helped me a lot with editing poems and books and just gossiping about the drama of a literary world. <laughs> uh, it's called Wishing on a Walleye. I flick a hockey bro lighter and read your texts about the nuance of Elder's story. Put said lighter to sage, sit in smoke, start peeling the label back to expose the lighter's white beginnings and wonder what party I stole this from back in the day. You run circles on old fur trade stomping grounds to bring warmth back in the body. I like to think you're just imprinting more footsteps on the land so the ancestors know that you've returned home. Your own call out to their story, love radiates throughout the land. I'll take my shirt off, sit and smoke at the top of the stairs that run up from Peonan, make the bros and broettes dodge my flabby body as I soak in bird song until you decide to kick my ass for taking too long in delivering moose meat and a common understanding that working for bur bureaucracy sucks moose nuts. <laughs> I'm continually dumbfounded by the way you can write history in the sky. I love if like someone would read this book and they're like, what do you think they mean by bureaucracy sucks moose nuts? <laughs> <laughs> Write history in the sky, paint water through veins, touch life back into concrete, troll wannabe politicians on Twitter. I want to be a bison herd with the strength to tear hooves through concrete and give you back all the downtown parking lots. I wish we only spoke in the hairway one. I wish we never looked at the northern lights. I wish we could ride on crane wings on the thermals of the city. I wish we could bring back all the kids who never had a chance. I wish that the Oilers won the cup and then they turned the arena into the Papa's Chase Reserve. I wish they gave all that 50-50 money back to the people whose land they're playing hockey on. But I'll settle for kicking your ass in Mario Kart on the nightly. <laughs> I don't know if she knows I was 